Hello everybody and welcome to the Institute for Government. I'm Jill Rutter, I'm Programme Director here and I'm really delighted to be chairing this second in our series with Oracle. Many thanks to Oracle for enabling us to bring you this series and, uh, and give you very nice hospitality outside uh, where we're looking at the government functions. Um, we've been, uh, been big champions of giving more emphasis to government functions as opposed to just assuming every civil servant is uh, able to do everything uh, as long as they've got a PPE degree. Um, anyway, talking to someone with a PPE degree. So uh, a few weeks ago we had John Thompson, the head of the operational delivery profession, and now, and I think very timely in the week of the budget and almost a starting gun being fired on the spending review that we welcome Mike Driver. Mike is the um, uh, Chief Financial Officer at the Ministry of Justice, DG Finance there, but he's also performs a really important cross-government role as the head of the government finance function. So, so this sort of relates to a theme of Institute work where we published in September 2017 a piece of work on professionalising Whitehall and we'll be writing up this event. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, please live tweet away with a hashtag which I can't see but I think you can. So the format today is going to be Mike is going to speak for an estimate of 10 to 12 minutes and to make sure that he doesn't overspend his time budget I'm told that his office will keep him firmly within that time uh, cash limit. Uh, we're then going to have reactions from our two panellists I'm delighted to introduce. Um, First of all, I've got my own colleague, Martin Wheatley. Martin's now working in Institute for Government on some work related to the Treasury and on the Spending Review, and published in September 2018 our look at how to do the Spending Review right this time, which calls for a much bigger role for the finance profession and financial skills in that. So Martin's going to briefly comment on that. Martin's got widespread experience uh, uh, in government and in local government, which is always a very interesting combination. And finally, we're going to have comments as well from Oracle's very own Anne-Marie Vinelot. Uh, Anne-Marie is a qualified accountant. I think well, Martin is certainly not a qualified accountant, are you, Martin? <laughs> anyway, so Anne-Marie is a qualified accountant. She's, uh, she's a recent uh, recruit to Oracle, uh, working on the sort of public sector issues there. But she has actually sort of got the Cook's tour of, uh, of public sector finance roles from the NHS uh, to a charity to performance reporting at the Treasury. So she has basically seen lots of it, so she's going to give her perspective too. But with such a qualified <coughs> audience in the room, uh, we're going to try and keep the comments from the stage relatively brief, looks at Fiona again, uh, and give you lots and lots of opportunities to pepper them with questions. Um, but I would remind any civil servant or anyone else in a sensitive role that this is being live streamed. That means if you say something that you might regret, we cannot edit it out afterwards. So please be suitably cautious and phrase, think about how you phrase your questions. So without further ado, Mike. I think I better just stay in my seat. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. Um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, so I'm Mike Driver, head of the government finance function, also the chief financial officer at the Ministry of Justice. Um, that might not always, I am a finance professional, and that might not always have been the case in my roles in the past. So I think one of the things that's important uh, to just recognise is that the civil service has uh, changed its approach to professionalism. And what we're trying to do with the functions as we go forward is to continue that journey. So today we're discussing how government can make uh, better financial decisions. And as head of the government finance function, I'm going to set out um, how far the functions have come on this agenda. Um, and in particular, I want to tell you something about where we're going next, um, where, what we're doing um, at the moment. Now clearly, and I'm sure there will be questions on this, there are significant challenges that lie ahead for the government and the public service more widely. Um, these include the clearly challenging economic and fiscal environment, the need to respond um, effectively to the UK's exit from the European Union, um, along with new challenges in respect of negotiating international trade agreements, 
Clearly, we're in the middle of a digital revolution and how we deal with that, uh, both as a nation and as finance um, and as other functions, I think is crucial. Um, and we have um, a political um, environment at the moment, uh, which is more difficult, perhaps, than it has been in the past. So these factors uh, provide, in my opinion, an unprecedented operating environment where making better financial decisions um, is a core requirement um, of the government, um, of government departments and uh, finance professionals and others across the whole of the public service. Within this context, I would argue, the demand on government is to deliver better outcomes uh, for citizens and the functional agenda is key um, to making better decisions in this complex, dynamic and unpredictable environment. I'm going to explain um, what this agenda is, why I believe functions have so much to offer and what the government finance function specifically is doing to ensure that government is well placed to make better financial, strategic and operating decisions and importantly to support better outcomes uh, for the taxpayer and for the users of public services. So functions are all about getting the right mix of people, process uh, and specialist expertise within and across government departments um, at the right time in particular. And I'll emphasise departments quite a lot because the function is not a huge central agency. The functional colleagues I work with in, in particular are in the main uh, vested within the government departments themselves. Um, essentially, we need the right people providing the right expertise to help us. Um, as government, we have focused on core areas, for example, commercial, communications, digital, uh, finance, HR, legal, and major projects. But we've also recently focused uh, a lot more time and effort on property with the establishment of the government property agency. And I would argue that these uh, functions underpin everything government does working to enable delivery. Until recently, we did not have enough of the skills and experience we needed. Today, that picture has improved greatly, but we're still not there. <coughs> the primary access of decision-making in government is always the departments, as I said previously. But functions recognise that sometimes the decision-making is more effective when mindful of cross-departmental considerations. And for example, within the finance function, um, within the Treasury, we've set up a costing unit, and that has been looking at end-to-end -end costing of systems, not just looking at the costs within an individual organisation. And in making better de uh, financial decisions in government, we need to understand who can um, expertly support these decisions. That's why functions are so important to set standards, to develop strategy, build capability and provide assurance. Um, and I would argue that without them, decisions will be made in silos without utilising the expertise that is available to us. So there needs to be a shift in government. Departments need to know what expertise is available to them and we need a relationship of trust to exist. The business of departments must be supported and enabled by expert functions. This is how functions can ensure that government can make better decisions. I'd like to spend a few minutes on the finance function, unless I'm told to shut up by Fiona, who will start waving at the, at the suitable point. I have no time management skills, by the way. Um, and in finance, we started by being very clear about what our vision was. So our vision for finance is we put finance at the heart of decision making, driving the agenda, not keeping score. Um, I would argue that this is consciously a bold vision. We are a leading function, really demonstrating our value to the business. We want to be the go-to trusted advisor. Uh, the government finance function has a critical role at the heart of government in delivering better political and business outcomes. And I would emphasize uh, two things from our vision. Uh, finance at the heart of decision making, I would say this is not a team sport. This is not, um, uh, this is a team sport. That was, uh, <laughs> this is not a competition, it is a team sport. So you could replace finance with commercial or HR because I believe that all of those functions should be at the heart of decision making. But the second part, driving the agenda, not keeping score, is really important to me. Um, because I still feel that there are far too many people, and this would, might lead to some comments from uh, Oracle in particular, there are too many people still involved in transactional activity. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're really
be moving um, forward at the shoulder of our partners to drive better decision making um, and sometimes to get well ahead of them to be scanning the, ho the horizon uh, much better as we go forward. I wanted to just mention that um, what I've tried to do is create a function, not just a profession. So when I took on the role, there was a risk that I was going to become the head of profession for the accountants across government. And though an accountant myself, and I really like accountants, uh, I think finance is far more than just accountancy. So I've broadened the concept of finance uh, from the profession to the function. I focused on building an inclusive function that emphasises what binds us together uh, and what uh, binds us together, what our similarities are. Uh, finance is now redefined to include uh, related disciplines covering planning and performance, risk and assurance, fraud, error, debt and grants, project finance, corporate finance and the Government Internal Audit Agency. The finance leadership group, which I chair, um, is my key leadership group across government. Um, it's far more inclusive than ever. We didn't in used to include all government departments on the finance leaders group. It was a slightly greatest um, organisation. We now have representatives uh, from all government departments. Uh, we have people from each of the affiliated functions and cross-functional representation, in particular uh, from commercial and project delivery. Um, I believe this is critical to enabling government to make better business decisions, for example, by forging a much closer relationship with the government's <laughs> internal audit agency. We've been able to uh, better spot key risks and issues across government and to work in a much more joined up and effective way. What I'd like to spend a moment on, I was told not to bring, to use any slides, but I brought a couple of slides. Um, we've tried to tell... <laughs> We've tried to tell our story to our staff really simply. So there are 10,000 finance staff and we need them to really understand what we're up to. So we've produced a very simple story. We've said what our vision is, uh, but we've also said what are, our, what are we trying to do as a function? And we've bro broken that down into six main areas. So having talked a lot about leadership and transformation and things and innovation and things of that sort, we start off by saying we need to get the basics right. Uh, we need to set good standards. Because unless we get the basics right in terms of uh, budgeting and forecasting and things of that nature, we lose the credibility to operate in a much better way and to become the, tr the trusted advisor uh, for people across <coughs> government. The second thing we've really focused upon, and I've mentioned the number of people who work across government uh, in finance, is on um, making sure that um, we consider our people and capability and that we um, become a high-performing and diverse organisation. And diversity is one of the things linked to becoming part of the brilliant civil service that is really important to me, to make sure that we are truly representative of society at all levels of, of our organisation. And over the last um, 12 months, I'm very pleased about the way in which we've encouraged and promoted people from within the civil service and people coming from outside of the civil service into many of our senior roles. But we've also set out for our people what we expect of them, what their career pathways could be, for example, through, the, uh, through different methodolog methodologies. We've also set out an operating model that we think should apply across um, the whole of the civil service in the finance environment. Uh, it's a simple pyramid. It says that at the bottom of it, we deliver transactional shared services. We need to deliver those much better than we do at the moment. Uh, they need to be consistently right every day. We then say that we need centres of excellence um, so that those are areas that we can do uh, better in a more joined up way across government. So we have set up a grant centre of excellence, we've set up a corporate finance centre of excellence, we're looking at technical accounting um, as a centre of excellence. Um, we have a tax centre of excellence. We used to have um, nearly 80 staff um, dealing with tax issues in departments across government. We now have a much more focused centre of excellence and the feedback we get um, from HMRC, um, it's a shame John isn't here today because I can sort of gloat on this. Um, the feedback we get from HMRC is that the way in which government is dealing with its own tax affairs is much more effective than it ever has been in the past. And then at the top of the pyramid, we have finance business partners, those trusted advisors and strategic finance colleagues dealing with the Treasury on spending reviews, budgets, things of that nature. 
We've then spent a lot of time thinking about finance insights, and by that, how do we use data and intelligence and insight much better? How do we make sure that information is flowing across departments effectively and up through departments into the Treasury so that we can better manage the public finances? We've then spent a lot of time talking about trusted advisors and what is a business partner. And for me, one of the problems we've had with business partners is too many of them don't know what a business partner is or how they should behave. Um, so we've spent time working with the private, and the private sector and other parts of the public sector to much better define that so that we can, we can set out for people what we expect them to do and what we don't expect them to do. So we're expecting to centralise management accounting far more in departments and possibly on a, more, on a wider scale. And the last area I'd like to focus on is planning and performance management risk and assurance. So it's not good enough to have financial strategy and planning done in one place and business planning done somewhere else or targeting and reporting not joined up with those, those things. So we've been ensuring that we join those activities up and also spending a lot of time looking at risk and assurance. Um, I don't know, one of the th I talked about standards, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is reviewing the Orange Book. Has anyone in the room heard of the Orange Book? Uh, so this is the guide to uh, best practice risk management in government, which was last updated 14 years ago. I think the world has moved on. So what we're trying to do at the moment is we're reviewing the way in which we do that. And importantly, we're trying to bring the thinking on risk management far early, you know, far forward in the process so that as we develop policies, we're thinking about the risks that we need, will need to manage through that process. So my final couple of comments, I just wanted to say something about what I'd like finance to be um, in the not too distant uh, future. Um, and I would, I would highlight a few sentences. You know, first of all, um, we have confidence and there is stronger financial management and control in departments and more importantly across the civil service. We maximise the use of public money. We make informed decisions based on evidence. Um, we help shape policy. We are not just reactive to policy happening. Uh, we get it right first time, or we certainly get it right first time more often than we do at the moment. And that we ensure, as I say, that decisions are based on um, a rich tapestry of information available to us, not just financial data, but all performance and uh, external data as well. <coughs> thank you. Mike, thank you very much. I think that was uh, a bit of time. Well done. Uh, excellent management there. So what we're going to do now is just get some comments from Martin and then Anne-Marie, and then we will see what you all have to say about that very interesting uh, recalibration of the finance system since uh, when I was first in government and basically people just counted the cash and that was all they did. They're just like controllers in the business rather than real proper finance people. Martin. Well, thank you, Jill. And, and Mike, um, I, I very much agree with what you said, in particular your last five points would seem to me <coughs> to be an excellent set of principles for um, how the finance function should work. And there's no doubt that finance professionalism has moved on massively uh, in my lifetime, which I still like to think isn't all that long, despite my grey hair. About 20 years ago, I was headhunted from the Treasury to a job in a department that better remain nameless, and the Permanent Secretary um, called me in and he said, um, you've got this job looking after a programme of several billion pounds a year distributed through complex agency landscape. And he said, um, uh, Martin, we need someone for this job who can do sums, and that's not something people in this department are very good at. So I think we definitely have moved on from there. Um, I, I wanted to make a couple of points, though. For all, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with what you say, Mike, um, on the theme of the proof of the pudding being in the eating. And I think uh, with the spending review next year uh, and with the Treasury obviously very pivotal to that, I want to make some points about the, the spending review and the Treasury. First, um, of course, the spending review is a, a political process, but it is also government's strategic resource plan. And I think it's unarguable that if the, the, the spending review doesn't work as a plan across the whole of government, it's going, however well uh, Mike and other um, CFOs do their job, um, it's, going to be, it's not going to be possible to plan with full effectiveness in departments. 
Now, one of the things we said in our spending review report um, was uh, an elaboration of a comment that was made to me about the spending review during the research phase, which was um, the numbers may add up, um, but are they the right numbers? In the sense, um, we picked up a lot of concern about optimism bias, costs being shunted sideways or out into the future through uh, accounting uh, devices, not enough focus on value, not enough focus on risk. And as you say, Mike, you're, you're addressing these things. Now, um, clearly, uh, you're right to be pushing forward, but one of the things I'll be looking for in the spending review is evidence that this spending review has become significantly better at making sure the numbers are actually right, as well as adding up on the day of the announcement. Secondly, um, the Treasury, uh, as the finance ministry, um, must be, you would think, would be the place where finance prof professionalism is absolutely uh, uh, core. And we know it is becoming more significant. Um, but um, we were also noted with disappointment, as the Institute has done previously, that separating out the leadership of the finance function from the leadership of the, the Treasury's uh, spending control work, we think was a, a pity and a backward step, which is not a comment about individuals at all, of course, but um, something uh, we would hope could be thought about um, in the future. And I know there are more people in spending roles in the Treasury and middle to senior levels that have a finance qualification, but how many of them are really deep finance professionals with the kind of depth of experience that you have, Mike. And I think, again, as we move forward, we would, be, uh, we would like to see um, real finance professionalism a much even richer part of the mix in the Treasury than it is now. OK. Martin. and marie okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, Firstly, I'd like to thank Mike and the Institute for Government. Um, it's great to be here uh, as part of Oracle, sponsoring this series of events across the professions and to be actively involved in those discussions. Um, and for me personally, it's actually great to be here because I used to work as part of the government finance function in the Treasury. Um, and, um, and for those of you who don't know, um, yes, I am a qualified accountant, but actually I spent 10 years in the private sector before I joined the public sector. And I was um, basically brought into the public sector to be a bit disruptive, which I'm quite good at, and uh, to bring a bit of challenge, to bring a bit of commercial expertise, and to, and to shake up some of the then, I think, uh, quite entrenched thinking. So we're talking sort of 10 years ago. I'm showing my age here, but uh, 10 years ago. Um, so for me, it's interesting to see that reflection of how the function has changed and moved and morphed. Um, and I think... Um, in moving around the sector quite a lot, and most recently in the NHS where I was a finance director, um, getting those qualified accountants into the right roles at the right time, in the right way, is one challenge, and getting the basics right is one challenge, and I think that's, I've seen different departments vary in how they achieve that, but I think that's definitely moved and shifted. Um, coming back to some of Mike's points, that whole concept of a finance person and I'm not necessarily an accountant, but anyone working in the function is taking into account the much broader context of what data you can pull in to create those informed decisions uh, and really make it much more of an of a operating function that is at the heart for a reason. You've got to be there for a reason. And it's not, as you're quite rightly saying, just to add up those numbers. So I like the phrase digital revolution. Um, I've recently seen lots of uh, indices about digital maturity, but what I would say is digital maturity isn't just about the IT systems, it's about the people that are in it. Um, for me personally, I think the finance function and the finance profession should absolutely be at the core of making that data revolution happen, because they're actually the ones who hold the threads. Yeah? If you're a decent finance professional, you will know exactly what is going on with your numbers and why and you will be at the table for that reason, and so therefore it's you in your roles that are actually going to make that data revolution happen. Um, and then for me there's that additional challenge, which I think Mike's actually already mm. alluded to, but which I had mm. come into this very much thinking that, that the big component for me is how you then make that data revolution happen across the departmental boundaries. So I see lots of great departmental mm. work, uh, lots of focus on getting everything right within those departments and a lot of willingness actually to work across the departments themselves but how do you take that 
great leap forward to make those organisational boundaries still be there because you will need them in terms of your roles and your remits, but actually take it forward as to how does that follow. In the NHS, we call it a patient pathway, and you'd go across all of those systems. Um, here is kind of following those taxpayers and those, those services through those pathways. So those would be my observations. Very interesting. Mike, I don't know whether you want to pick up on any of those points. I mean, for, first of all, Martin's challenge about the Treasury's ownership of this agenda. Uh, we were very, very pleased a few years ago when the Treasury decided to combine the role of head of the finance profession with the Director General for Public Spending. That has to be said, again, as Martin said, absolutely not calling for the individual to be sacked, but we're slightly disappointed because it's a bit retrograde when the decision was taken to appoint <coughs> somebody who wasn't a finance professional uh, as a very, very outstanding Treasury official, but as the DG Public Spending, and then move that. So how is that relationship working between you as head of the finance profession and the Treasury as the sort of, you know, <coughs> Martin says, you know, economics department, but also the finance department? Is that, uh, is that seamless, or has there been any sort of loss with the uh, splitting of the roles? So um, I fundamentally disagree with the arguments that is being levy, levelled that yeah. um, we need to have a single person in the Treasury. Um, I would argue um, that, I, I, I would assert that we now spend much more time worrying about the finance function from a Treasury's perspective now than we ever have done before. If Julian Kelly was here, who was my predecessor, um, who's the yeah, who's yeah. the person the that you said was person. the unified yeah. person? Um, I would th I would say that he would he would um, assert that in any week he probably spent ninety five percent of his time worrying about public expenditure mm. and uh, public sector pay issues and things of that sort, dealing with <coughs> treasury ministers, than he did worrying about the finance function. And many of the much of his time would have been worrying about uh, senior roles within yeah. the function. I think what we've done now is we've created um, the opportunity for, and we have invested um, in that opportunity from a Treasury's perspective, to seize the agenda far more fully than we've ever done before. So some might see it as a weakness that I'm both in the MOJ and in the Treasury. I see it as a strength. Um, I have to take my own medicine, not just give medicine <laughs> to others. Um, I think that is a positive step forward. Uh, there are, of course, time constraints which yeah. uh, anyone in any job will face, but um, we're able to manage that at the moment. Um, we've established and we've invested in three directors um, across the function, um, two of whom are co-located with me in the MOJ. One, Veronica Povey, who's in the audience here today, is the joint head of the public expenditure um, directorate with the, with the Treasury. So the team that's responsible for public expenditure has both a functional lead and a Treasury fiscal lead. Both of them are qualified accountants, by the way. And, and I think that is a really positive step forward. Um, as the head of the function, I am challenged by the non-executives of the board about the progress that I'm being made. Um, and that is at political and non-executive level. So I feel that the Treasury hasn't taken a step back. I would argue that the Treasury has taken many steps forward on this agenda. OK, I'm sure there are going to be more comments and questions <coughs> on, on that point. Martin, do you want to come back at all on that? Or we... No, more time for the audience. More time, for the, more time for the I just want to pick up, uh, pick up the very interesting point that Anne-Marie raised about the sort of difference having finance as a function makes. We're used, used in spending reviews and indeed within departments and working with their arm's length bodies for this to be a sort of relationship which sometimes in the past, I'm sure not now, used to be characterised by sort of non-disclosure of information, a bit of gaming, sort of bilateral negotiation between the two or whatever. But you've given this vision of a sort of seamless flow of information across all these functional people who may be working in different departments but are part of the same function or may be working for different bodies, reporting to their own boards, having a very interesting conversation about your sort of, you know, the way in which the Ministry of Justice now organises its finance function through that big network of arms length bodies with different degrees of statutory and non-statutory independence uh, and their own accountabilities. I just wonder if you could give a bit of a picture about how you reconcile those people's responsibilities, their direct organisation, with this notion of joining up through the function, whether that is answering 
Anne Marie's question about organisational boundaries and yeah. not really getting in the way of efficiency, which you've always felt it it does, but you've always understood why people sort of do that. Uh, yeah. So th this goes back to something I tried to um, yeah. articulate in my my short presentation. What we're trying to achieve is a much more matrix situation than we've ever had in the past. So the majority of finance uh, professionals, functional staff, um, operate within departments, and that's the place for them to operate. And they are generally operating in silos up through their accounting officer um, and accountable to parliament. But what we're trying to do is to get those people to think differently and to operate in a much more system basis. And I should say at this point that what, as I say, we're not trying to uh, create a huge organisation that does this once and well, and I like your term disruptor. I think the function in some ways is a dis disruptor in its own right, uh, but also a catalyst and a coordinator to make sure that um, information flows better I'd like to get to seamless, but better would be a good enough for me at the moment. Um, but if, if we take um, a spending review as a good example, um, I don't want a senior Treasury official to stand up in the future to say it's fantastic <clears throat> that we've got 10,000 new uh, police officers um, on the streets protecting the citizens without there having been any discussion about what the impact of that would be on the criminal, on, on the CPS, the courts, the prisons and the probation systems. So what we need to do, and this is my point really, is rather than operate in the traditional bilateral routes, spending team with the Home Office, for example, we have a discussion which involves the whole chain and the whole system um, in that discussion so that we can look at all of the impacts on public services and on public finances uh, as a result of potential adjustments to government policy and allocative decisions. And is the spending review going to be set up on that sort of, you know, uh, sort of end-to-end -end spending basis or is it going to sort of have some good intentions and a few little reviews set up? But then at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, it's all done in a darkened room to make the spreadsheets add up, which is always our, our sort of fear at the end of the day when the Treasury actually has its envelope and needs to cram everybody, everybody in. And well, for me, uh, for me, plans need to be deliverable. Um, um, but it's the process of planning that's, I think Eisenhower said that, wasn't it? Planning is great, a plan is useless. And um, I think Eisenhower said that uh, the plan for D-Day worked well until they left harbour. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> What, what we need to do is we need to have better conversations going on. What we're doing at the moment uh, within the Treasury and the, with, in the combination with the function, um, we've got a group of people who are trying to work out what is the best way of the spending review operating. So uh, Veronica with Conrad Smewing and with many of our best finance directors, commercial yeah. colleagues, um, project delivery colleagues are trying to do the very thing that you're talking about. Whether we're able to pull that off, we will see, because at the end of the day, time will be limited and some there are political choices that will need to be made. But we are endeavouring to improve the way in which uh, planning and performance management, and I think a spending review is just a particular focus on planning and performance management, uh, is taken forward in the future. And do finance directors have enough status within departments and if you look at some of the accounting officer duties, accounting officers are supposed to, supposed to object and ask for directions on you know, regularity, propriety, but the Treasury also uh, a few years ago introduced this notion that accounting officers should be prepared to object on feasibility grounds. I think we, we scored a record with our first ever feasibility direction, I think, uh, earlier this year or last year when Jonathan's yeah, the Department for Education on, yeah, yeah. on T level, just saying we can't do it. But we've seen some big projects, you know, I won't mention universal credit, but maybe sort of where you sort of basically wonder whether a more self confident finance profession should have been advising permanent secretaries <coughs> actually ministers' plans were just actually not deliverable on the schedules and within the resource envelope available. So you know, sometimes we contrast uh, with local government where sort of finance professionals have a sort of independent right to object. Do you think the finance function, you know, has got there yet where it can actually force permanent secretaries maybe to seek more directions? Francis Maud always said he wanted, uh, wanted civil servants to publicly object more, then be overruled and get on with it. But, you know, I just wonder whether you felt we got that balance right yet. Well, um 
I'd make two points. First of all, I think finance um, directors in organisations are much more confident today than they were several years ago. I feel that um, they have uh, networks which allow them also to bounce ideas off each other more effectively uh, than they could have in the past. Um, I don't think just seeking directions is the answer. Um, and I think this comes back to what I was saying about uh, skill, capability, uh, a focus on risk and assurance, uh, getting the basics right. I think that um, as we advise our ministers on what is achievable and what is not achievable, um, we need to say that um, very honestly, yeah. which is the, always the responsibility um, of a civil servant in this instance. But feasibility is important. We shouldn't be promising that we're going to do things which we don't believe that we can. And if I give you an example uh, of the Ministry of Justice, at the last spending review, um, we made two big bets um, in the spending review. Um, my predecessors, I think, um, were in many respects having to do this, uh, given the MOJ is an, a non-protected department. But there was a bet that we could raise more money through uh, charging mm -hmm. and also that we would see the prison population mm -hmm. and legal aid demand reduce. Mm -hmm. Neither of those things has proved to be the case, hence the difficulty that we face as a department. Mm -hmm. But I think there should have been far greater uh, focus on the risks being made around those assumptions um, much earlier in the process and to highlight to departmental ministers, treasury ministers and yeah. others um, what we were potentially going to let ourselves in for. Okay, let's go to questions. We've got some people very keen. We've got some roving mics. So let's, uh, let's take the questions in clutches of... Uh, Three, if there are three questions. Uh, we'll go right to the far back. And if anyone's in the overspill room wants to ask a question, you have to come and put your head around the door. Um, so it's right in the far back. And then we'll go to David, to Sarah, just there. Yeah. Thanks, Jill. Tell us who you are. Um, yes, Josh Bell from Liberator. We do a lot of business and finance and accounting with uh, MOJ and HMCTS. Um, I wonder if uh, Mike and other panellists can give some examples, some concrete examples, on a before and after basis of where the new approach that he has elaborated on has had an impact and how it might have happened in the past uh, to the detriment of the public and the taxpayer. Okay, excellent. David. David Walker, Guardian Public. <clears throat> Mike mentioned internal audit, but interestingly didn't mention external audit. And I wonder if he might say something about the relationship between the finance function in Whitehall and you might think allies who are doing God's work to secure efficiency and effectiveness through the NEO, when in fact one seems to see too often a resistance to uh, embracing the findings of successive NEO critical reports, whether mediated through the PAC or not. And uh, just a bit about, particularly at a time when we're going to get a new CNAG and potential change in the, the mood uh, in the relationship between the uh, professional external auditors uh, of Whitehall and the finance function. Okay, and I think there was a question down here. Helen, yeah. Thanks. Helen John, I'm uh, the CFO of, of an arm's length body. Mike, it'd be useful um, perhaps if you could say something about the, the process of the spending review because uh, it strikes me for something that's essentially our strategic planning event for quite a long time. Um, the cross-government working and working up the evidence and cases and things like that, they do take time. And uh, I have to say that um, trying to explain to outsiders why I don't know what the deadlines are and you know when I'll actually have to do it and what period I'll have to cover and those kind of things, they, they look at me as though I'm a bit mad. Um, <laughs> And I appreciate it, you know, there are political things there, but actually if we're going to plan properly, people need more understanding of the timing and the process too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's start with that. Let's just put Helen out of her misery as far as we can. Uh, what, you know, what's it going to look like? What's the sort of, what should she be watching out for at least to give her a bit of information about the process for the spending review? So first of all, um, Treasury colleagues haven't... Um, haven't announced when the spending review will be, although I think we can assume it will be announced at some point uh, next year. Um, and nor have the Treasury announced how many years the spending review is going to take. So that's where we are uh, in terms of the debate. But um, to give a slightly better yeah. answer to your question, um, and it goes back to the point I was trying to make, uh, that a spending review 
is a particular focus on planning uh, at a point in time. I think all organisations should be involved in continuous planning. Uh, and I'll give you an MOJ example, but I think I could apply this to the FCO or any other government departments at the moment. Um, we've developed a longer term vision, um, um, Justice 2020. Um, we have a medium term strategy and we have a single departmental plan that lasts for this next and the year after. Um, so we are doing that constant planning. We have an evidence base and we will be able to use that evidence at the point at which the Treasury announced the spending review. What I want to avoid is um, what, a, what has appeared to happen all too often which is the Treasury announced a spending review in July, send a great wad of questions to every department, go on holiday, leaving everyone else to answer that question for September when everyone gets back from their holidays. Um, this has got to be a far more open, continuous process. But I do believe that much of the work is already being done in departments at the moment. It, therefore, it just needs to be rebranded spending review work rather than departmental strategising and planning. Do you have any view about what the right length... I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty because of Brexit sitting there as a sort of elephant in the room. But do you have a view on what's the right length of time? We've actually had an SR that seems to have lasted, you know, almost forever. This 2015 spending review just seems to have sort of staggered on much longer than you might have expected with the chance of dribbling in bits of cash uh, and being criticised for for getting into that sort of uh, emergency cash injection mode by some of my colleagues. Just wondered whether you thought three years is, you know, in a normal world, is three years best? Should it be five years? Or actually should we revert to what, you know, used to be, which was every year and the, um, the out years were basically well, my, my, slightly joke baselines for... My, my, my preference is not to return to the old pre-spending review world of PES mm. rounds, yeah. which I think are too short to focus. Mm. Um, I think that... Uh, there is some merit in doing five years, but I think that you're moving more into a strategy rather than planning yeah. at, on a five-year basis, particularly given the environment that we, the fast-moving environment in which we operate. So my preference um, would be something around a three-year period because I think that gives people a little bit more budgetary certainty yeah. uh, to plan against. Okay, and Marie, this um, question from the back about you know. View from outside, you've been very sort of observe sort of the differences that a sort of the new finance function is making. Is bringing. Um, I think that the key thing is actually seeing much, much more of the finance professionals stepping forward into CEO type roles um, and actually in, in public sector into mm -hmm. the um, home sec type roles. You've got Claire Moriarty, for example, with her finance background, John Thompson, who we'd all know. Um, and, um, and that kind of shift in, in uh, profile in uh, ability to take organisations forward in leadership is really palpable, I think, in the last few years in particular. Martin, any, any sort of things you would point to as sort of examples of things that seem to be happening better now that wouldn't have happened? I, 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 as I said at the beginning of yeah. my remarks, I think it, it is, though it is a necessary and not sufficient condition for good financial management, the fact that it would now be unthinkable for people in senior finance roles to be, uh, not to be uh, finance professionals is a major step forward. But it, it's the sort of the start of something yeah. rather than the finish of it, as Mike was uh, saying. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm going to come to you for your specific example now. What's, this, what's the big pitch about the difference having sort of so I'll, I'll confident the, 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 finance I think, I think it's a made. really good question, by the way. Um, I think the example I would give would be the collapse of Carillion. So um, terrible you know, issue that the organisation um, ceased trading. But the way in which government would have reacted to that without the functions is on a department by department mm. basis. Um, there would have been bilateral, lots of bilateral discussions occurring through that process. And um, I would like to take credit for mm. a lot of what was done, but in fact it was the commercial function mm. that really stepped forward, um, created a, a unified civil service approach, multi-departmental approach, to how we were going to deal with that, supported by a strong finance function yeah. and a very strong uh, HR function. And I believe that um, had we not had that approach, um, many more people would have lost their jobs, many more services would have been very badly damaged. So should those functions, though, have been sort of 
in there in advance saying to people, well, Carillion might look like a good bet to give contracts, but actually uh, we have some worries about going on and being so reliant on a sort of, you know, big provider and stuff. I mean, were the functions empowered enough to actually, you know, push out warning signals about are these, uh, you know, are we uh, managing our risk well by being so dependent on one big outsourcing company, some of the sort of worries about the financing when the government seem to be continuing to let contracts to Carillion? Well, outsourcing is an issue that has been picked up yeah. by the PAC and others. Um, so clearly there are lessons to learn from the approach that's yeah. been taken. Um, but I would argue that the, the information that um, the commercial organisation is now collating with finance colleagues using uh, Crown representatives far yeah. more effectively um, is adding value and will help us to manage our relationships um, much better and our, f our commercial decisions um, much better um, in the future. Just going on to David's question about the relationship with the, with the National Audit Office who, in a sense, you know, should be empowering for the finance function that the NAO will be there and, uh, and holding people to account for poor financial management. So if people are slightly tempted to waver from the path of true enlightenment, they basically know the NAO will be there sort of you know, bolstering them. But what do you see? Do you think the NAO is getting it right? And what would your advice be to the next CNAG about how to really promote the cause of better financial management and better financial performance in government for taxpayers' benefits? Do you think they've got that right at the moment or not? So as the finance function, we haven't pushed the NAO away, first of all. So the NAO, um, over the last six months, have been to the finance leaders group uh, twice <coughs> talking about uh, their programmes for VFM studies, um, what they're seeing across the board in terms of financial management and looking at how we can improve um, the basics of accounting in departments <coughs> um, and improve um, the stories that we tell through our annual report and accounts. And I think, I think that is important. I do think that there is an issue for the NAO um, as they look at the amount of time they spend on financial auditing as compared to value for money studies and making sure that they focus the same amount of uh, time and effort on the front sections of sets of accounts as they do on the back sections. Uh, and my, my issues, uh, you know, if I was giving advice to whoever becomes the next um, CNAG, it would be that you know, the, the audit function more widely needs to continue to modernise. It needs to um, be relevant. I think the aud you know, external auditors have spent the last 170 years telling everyone what their role is looking backwards, mm. and I think we need to have auditors who are mm. looking forward as well. And Marie? Yeah support exactly that point so that uh, audit role is about two aspects isn't it it's mm. about the core financial component of controllership and mm. compliance and we absolutely need to have that and to, to keep us honest as it were and transparent um, and mm. to, to push the boundaries of how uh, any public sector organization is going about mm. that and private mm. sector one um, but then there's there is that component that is about well they have the opportunity to look above and outside that individual department or organisation, provide um, best practice opportunities, provide challenge, provide a bit of vision um, that can then be tapped into and really used to, to help move organisations forward because it gives that, that external view. Um, but yes, there is something around how you can, you can take things forward, that whole stance of not just the traditional reporting of a, of, of a finance function yeah. and an audit function, but actually how do you take it forward into the future is a, is a key challenge in that. Okay, let's have some more... Oh, Martin, yes. Sir. A, a couple of points on that, yeah. if I may. First of all, I'm, I'm on a housing association board myself, and what I observe uh, that's different about the relationship between our auditors and the NAO and departments is it feels more like a continuous engagement with audit committee members of the board, as well as mm. with the, obviously, with, with uh, the full-timers, um, and a, 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 a helping us make sure we get it right in advance rather than coming along and telling us off afterwards for getting it wrong. I think part of the issue with the NAO, I haven't looked at the Exchequer and Audit Act for some time, I must confess, but it's the extent to which the statutory role of the CNAG 
um, is perhaps based on a rather old-fashioned no notion of the relationship between external auditors and who they're auditing. That might be worth looking at. And our spending review report and uh, uh, colleagues in other re uh, recent yeah. reports here have said there is a particular gap in the scrutiny and assurance uh, of government's forward plans. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a, that's a topic we will be returning to. Um, the House of Commons Procedure Committee yeah. is, has asked people uh, whether they think it would be a good idea to have a Commons committee that looked at government financial planning rather than the PAC just coming along afterwards and exploring what went wrong. I think I agree with a lot of what you said, but I think there is still an important separation that has to occur between the external auditor and the, and the, um, the organisation <laughs> being audited. And there have been cases, and the FRC is doing some work on this as we go forward, to ensure that that... Uh, separation and distance is properly maintained Don't think for the professional going reasons. Going to sell you consultancy services, though. Which I think is no, that's alert. no. But there are other there are other ways that you can get too close yeah. to your auditors. No, I've seen that from the private sector, I have to say. Uh, let's go along the front row because I've got various people will be very upset if they don't get a chance. So, go to Andrew, and then. Let's go. Mike, you've set out a very, uh, very exciting agenda. And, Andrew, can you tell us who you are? Uh, sorry, I'm Andrew Lickerman from the London Business School. Um, you've set out a very exciting agenda. Um, can I just go to the question of the trusted advisor role? Um, you know, the problem for a long time has been that um, generally civil servants have not known what they don't know, and therefore it's not been clear to them necessarily that, that they come to the finance function for advice. Yeah. Is that still true, do you think? And what are you doing, you know, what, what do you think can be done and what are you doing to alert them to what the trusted advisor can do? Yeah. Okay, let's go there and then Sarah, if you can go down to that. Yeah. So yes. Andrew Sanderson from the FCO. Um, particularly a question for Anne-Marie and Martin. Are there any particular lessons that you think the government finance function and departmental finance functions could learn from the wider public sector or the private sector? Okay, interesting question. And then... Um, Julian McRae from uh, King's College London, but previously at the Institute for Government. Um, just quickly, following the changes in the finance profession, it's great to hear you talk about putting finance at the heart of decision making, something that actually comes from about 2013, uh, when Richard was leading mm. the profession through Julian Kelly's time and into yours, um, and the movement from a profession to a function being really, really vital in that. Um, and I think it's really important that we see these changes embedded over time uh, and the persistence of view, which you can see has improved in HR and leadership structures in all kinds of very tangible ways. Um, one question I've got, though, is about transparency and showing how we're improving and what we're doing, particularly around those big key decisions. So two questions are slightly related. Um, first, do you think the MOJ has a financial model that it can use to uh, inform ministers that kind of relates the inputs to outputs to outcomes ministers want and has the key risks sort of embedded within that? And then secondly, assuming your answer to that question is yes, can you think of any good reason from the point of view of taxpayers and service users, not from the point of view of ministers and mm. officials, why that model should not be transparent in the sense that we should be able to see what those assumptions are, test that model, have some independent scrutiny of how it's improving and how it's developing? Okay. Thank you very much, Julie. Let's... Uh Let's start off with, uh, with Andrew's question. Um, so, do people really, I mean, it's, this has been one of the really interesting questions in government, I think it'd be a big question when we have Rupert McNeil here in a few weeks' time. So people in government are very sceptical about that HR can add any value if you're there. You've had a long experience of HR adding very little value if you've sat in government departments and tried to avoid them, whatever. So, do people sort of understand what early involvement and strategic involvement of their financial professionals can, can bring to their decisions, and particularly when they're sort of, of course, more used to working with analysts, economists, and people doing the sort of business cases. You know, where are you making uh, the offer, and how's that getting through to yeah, people? Yeah. So we've, we've done a lot of work on the trusted advisor business partner work, as I mentioned, both with the private sector and the public sector. And I won't name the organisations, but 
but two that spring to mind both gave me the same figure. They've gone through the work that we have, we've been going through trying to address their business partner model to become the trusted advisor. And they have identified within their named business partners 50% of the people who hold those roles or held those roles at the time either didn't have the skills and capabilities to be business partners or didn't want to be because they wanted to be something else, a management accountant or, or the like. And so that is why we've tried to much better, to, to define much better what a business partner is. In terms of the trusted advisor, the, the trusted advisor can't just sit on their hands and hope someone comes and asks for trusted advice, which I think is your, is your point. So the skills and capabilities of these people have to be um, not just financial, but they have to have good collaborative skills. They need to be able to sell themselves um, and they need to be relevant in the discussions. They need to push themselves in and show the value of it. You talk about economists. Um, I, I think we need to have far more diversity of thinking than we have at the moment. I think that some of the worst teams are just accountants or just economists yeah. because both groups will think in the same way you know, in their own yeah. professional ways. So what we need to do is we need to bring those people, as well as policy, other policy makers, yeah. operational <coughs> colleagues, project professionals, into mm -hmm. the decision making that we have. But one of the things I've said to my business partners in the MOJ and more widely is it's not good enough to just be good at finance yourself. You need to raise the standards of what other people um, can do themselves. So if we were to think of finance on a scale of one to 10, I think the line should do one to six on their own mm. and the trusted advisors should be helping them and teaching mm. them to do that and then the trusted advisors should be getting themse mm. either themselves or their colleagues to be doing the complicated seven to ten stuff themselves and I think through that model we can improve the way in which decisions are taken and the trusted advisor becomes a reality. Lots of nods from the audience there for people watching uh watching on the live stream who can't see that that's uh, that's us has gone down extremely well in the room um the question from andrew what's what sort of can the government finance function learn from the wider public sector Anne marie you've worked in yeah sure uh, okay. that you've worked in charities as well so you've got to mix what do you think the big lessons are so um so for me there's there's the whole element of community that ability to to reach out and reach out across your not just your profession actually but to other function to to other professions and to work with them collegiately as much as possible is is one aspect and i think you know the government's very much trying hard mm. to do that but i think there are there are other sectors who potentially need to be looked at and we've we've uh, pointing at Andrew here, we've talked about the HFMA and the NHS, which is a finance community, um, a smaller environment than, than central government in the sense of the size of the organisations, but a very strong sense of guidance, community regulatory advice. Um, the, the second component is actually the finance profession in government has been lacking in bolshiness <laughs> and, and I think initially having that discussion to kind of wait outside the door and, and wait to be invited in to the discussions as opposed to going and banging on the door or even simply just walking in to the discussions or, or telling them afterwards actually I would have been helpful in that space you have to demonstrate value if you want to be around that table and you have to do it dynamically and that dynamic isn't often a word that's associated with accountants that much and actually it needs to be and it's up to you to make that leadership call and, and you have to be that person who's everyone wants you in the room yeah I think you all know that I think all of your teams probably know that it's hard to actually make it happen um, but getting that bit more bolshy and then I think the, the other bit is um, in the private sector, how, how do you make finance matter to the non-financial people? And again, I've seen components of that in, in governmental finance, but um, more of it needs to happen, more of that, how do you bring uh, financial management across the whole organisation up to speed and make it matter? Um, to budget holders is a really core component what, to what trying to achieve. What about the comparison with local government? You've seen bits of, sort of local government in action. Well, uh, our local government and housing mm. and to a limited extent the private sector. Um, I agree with everything Anne-Marie said and, 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 and Mike, mm. you're, you're clearly on to all of this as well. Mm. So it's just sort of encouraging you onwards and upwards. I think, I think the, the, key, you know, the key test would be whether central government has senior 
genuinely professional finance people at top tables uh, going forward. And they're not just sitting there, but they uh, people with other backgrounds um, are, are recognise um, their, the, their potential and contribution. I agree very much uh, you can't sit there and expect people to recognise that mm. what you bring to the party but there is also a demand side of the equation and there's a, perhaps a role for permanent secretaries and others in reinforcing an expectation that uh, where people are, 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 are qualified, professional, proactive advisors of the kind you're describing, uh, they, need to, they need to be brought into the discussion and the tent. And one, uh, one clear difference between Whitehall and uh, local government and housing and elsewhere at the moment is that in all of these sectors, um, being a, a, a CFO FD is, is one of the, the, the preeminent routes to the top. Mm. Um, I, mean John, I think we, we, John Thompson is probably the only uh, Claire, perm secretary. Claire, yeah. Yeah. And Claire, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's um, uh, in five years, a key test, I think, for uh, the development of the finance function compared with other sectors would be in five years' time, how many perm secs uh, have a finance function background? And you'd expect, you'd expect it to be a higher percentage than is, it is now. Is the civil service actually doing stuff to, to sort of, you know, actually take people who are coming up through, you were talking to me earlier about how you started off in policy and were sort of talent spotted into, into finance or slightly accidentally went into finance when there wasn't a policy job immediately available. <clears throat> but is the civil service doing enough to enable people to grow from finance, commercial and stuff like that into a... The, you know, the departmental leadership, you know, one position, so that they really can challenge some of the people who you know, spent their life courting <coughs> ministers and doing policy and stuff like that, and so they can really challenge those top jobs. Um, so we're, we're encouraging, as a function, more people yeah. to see finance mm. um, as a career pathway mm. for them. Um, so we have many strategy and policy directors yeah. across the civil service um, currently doing finance qualifications. We have been in discussion with both SIPFA and SEMA mm. to make their qualifications more relevant. Mm. So we now have a combined qualification between those, in, those two mm. institutes picking up the best aspects of public finance with the best aspects of management mm. accounting as well. Um, we are also trying mm. to um, encourage people from the private sector and other mm. sectors to join, our, to join the civil service and we're being successful in that. Um, it's, it's life as well, mm. but we're also seeing some really talented people leave mm. the civil service because their skills and capabilities mm. are so valuable mm. that they're being bought by private and uh, other parts of the public no sector. Names. Naming no names, Anne-Marie. Uh, but anyway, uh, Julian's question about, uh, about whether you have a Ministry of Justice financial model to talk, presuming your ministers and your senior officials through you know, the choices they are being confronted with. And then his second question, if you do... Uh, in the same way as the Treasury publishes the economic model that whatever that you know, anyone can play with and feed in their own assumptions or we can see sort of tax ready reckoners out there and stuff like that. Do your own budget. I mean, do you have something so, that is your, you know... So we don't have a ready theory. reckoner. So we don't have, you know, the black box that mm. creates every answer mm. for us. But of course, as an organisation, and um, I think at the MOJ, our single departmental plan, the internal mm. one is viewed as one of the very best in government because it does link inputs to activities, um, to outputs, to outcomes. That is much more difficult to do in some areas than it is in, in others. We should recognise that and not feel that we can just create uh, that link um, so, so easily. So that's in the private SDP, not the published SDP? Yeah, this is in, yeah, this is in the one that we ha hold in the departments and that we operate. So what would be the objections to putting, um, putting that out there? Uh, for other people to sort of scrutinise what assumptions you make and then um, uh, be transparent. We're all interested. I think that's, I think that's uh, something for us to reflect upon and to determine whether or not uh, both Treasury, Cabinet yeah. Office and Departments would be comfortable, but that's not something for me to, uh, to argue about today. Yeah. But what I, what I do think, and I think Michael Barber's work yeah. has been really important in this, um, he has set a slightly different tone by, by saying that we should focus far more on outputs and outcomes 
whereas yeah. traditionally departments have focused on inputs and activities. Yeah. And I think we, are, we have seen, and uh, I was at the launch of the M Michael Barber's work yeah. with the Chief Secretary, a real um, energy within the Treasury yeah. to make sure that that work is taken forward and I hope mm. properly captured in the next spending review as well. Now, we've got about 10 minutes left. And I want to make sure everybody who wants to say something has a chance. So I'm going to take everybody. So let's start there. So along that line. And then we'll come to, yes, yes, Simon. Um, Simon Judge, Cabinet Office. Uh, just to go back to the discussion on the basics and the, and the role of external audit in particular. Um, Martin, one bit of the NAO Act that you ought to read is the bit that gives the NAO a statutory monopoly. I think that is and part of the issue. Uh, the other point, and I say this with some trepidation with Andrew Lickerman in the room, and it's not an argument against transparency, is you know, have we made the whole system of accounting and parliamentary control and supply just so complicated that it is taking up far too much time of people across the finance function, is not actually delivering useful, transparent project, pro products, uh, and you know, is not really fit for purpose? Is, is there an agenda there that uh, you know, the Treasury needs to grasp. That's not the NEO's fault. They audit against the standards that are set. They don't set the standards. Okay, yes, and if you could give the mic to the President, it's very good. Yeah, so Gary Much, I'm the um, Government Affairs Lead for Oracle. Um, Mike, you touched on the Carillion collapse. You also rightly touched on the importance of risk and assurance in your opening remarks. My comments about um, the Chancellor's policy shift away from PFI announced earlier this week and how you prepare the profession um, the finance profession for that removal of that route to market, but also existing PFIs that are probably fast coming to the end of their life and the implications for that. Okay, and we've got Christopher here, Sarah. Yeah. Chris Foster, VGI, but talking in my own capacity. Uh, one point I think we've been dodging around, which I'd like to suggest we should be are firmer about. Uh, I can remember in the private sector, uh, you know, there was a, a great distance between spending and receive, making profit. Uh, what surely we ought to be aiming at and trying to decide what the priorities of getting there first is a, a very clear um, estimation of benefits and also exposed an evaluation of what was actually achieved. Uh, cost benefit analysis of something of that kind, easier uh, in some places than others, yeah. easier, yeah. I think, towards the bottom, Anne-Marie, and at the top, but surely that is something which should give <coughs> quite a lot of emphasis. Okay, there's three very interesting and, uh, and different questions there. <coughs> Let's kick off with Simon's point about uh, about Parliament, um, you know, we've got the sort of nexus of activity, the NAO, the Public Accounts Committee seem to be in almost permanent session. Permanent session, as far as I can see, spending their entire life at the moment giving evidence to different select committees on their Brexit preparations and things like that. You know, do we actually have a system of transparency, parliamentary interest that actually delivers better value and control and defends the taxpayers' interest, or is it just a complete opaque mess. Martin, what do you think? Well, um, picking up Christopher's point about cost benefit and applying it to that question, yeah. I mean, Simon is, is, is raising an important point about how much effort goes into Whitehall in feeding that machine of parliamentary mm. accountability. Yet, I think there's, 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 there's an increasing view among thoughtful members and others, that Parliament isn't actually very good at using all of that information in order to apply effective scrutiny. Mm. Now, I would hope there might be a potential deal there in which mm. um, uh, less is more, uh, a different, you know, a, 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 a less voluminous uh, approach to feeding information to Parliament would help Parliament um, uh, understand better what's going on and ask the right <coughs> questions. Um, but as well as the Whitehall side of the machine getting uh, better at doing that, that would require uh, parliamentarians actually to take this stuff seriously. And I think we, you know, we in the Institute, we will be continuing to think and uh, write about uh, some of these things. I think it's a very useful point. And Mike, you must spend quite a lot of time preparing people for sort of parliamentary scrutiny 
and providing information to Parliament, you know that they have hearings on select committee hearings on departmental annual reports where all they ever do is talk about the last thing that's in the news the day before rather than sort of focus in detail about what the department's delivered and things like that. So if you were actually advising parliamentarians, one of my colleagues does quite a lot of work with parliamentary committees on actually how how they should use that information, what they should ask for and what actually is a sensible approach to scrutinising departmental activity through their sort of financial information. What would you be what would you be saying if you had so I'm a, I'm a supporter here. of the way in which the system operates at mm -hmm. the moment. I believe that it's important that um, s accountable civil mm. servants and mm. ministers are um, questioned by mm. select committees. Uh, in fact, I'm at the Justice mm. Select Committee next week. But I also think that the relationship with the Select Committee doesn't always have to just be in Parliament. Mm. And having informal <laughs> discussions with them, mm. giving the Select Committee an opportunity uh, to visit mm. operations and see what's happening on the ground as part mm. of, of their work mm. is really important. Um, I think the annual report and accounts is an interesting piece because annual report and accounts are complicated. Mm. Uh, they're very mm. difficult to read. So we need to give select committees um, an understanding of what the accounts are saying. We need to give them a summary version of those accounts so that they can just walk their way through them and understand what the big numbers and the movements um, are showing. Mm. But I also think um, it, is, um, it is really important to... Uh, to maintain that transparency of of data mm. as we go forward, and I think a move back from that would be would be disrespectful and inappropriate. Okay. Um, the question about uh, about preparing for the demise of PFI while sort of managing out the sort of residual contracts, the Chancellor's announcement on on Monday that the government wasn't going to sign any more deals, but and was going to look at ways of actually reducing the burden of some of the implicitly not so great PFI deals that the government's committed itself to. Um, it's clearly, that's clearly going to be a big role for your finance professionals to, to try and do that. So what are you, what are you doing? Exactly. Well, I, I think you've slightly overstated what the Chancellor said, oh, right. first okay. of all. I think the Chancellor said that there would be no new PF2 um, deals announced. But what the Chancellor didn't say oh. is that there wouldn't be an ongoing requirement for private sector investment um, in the economy as we go forward. Mm. So nobody has said what the future will, yeah. uh, will bring, but um, there is clearly going to be more work needed to determine mm. what that will look like. Um, I think, though, in terms of um, the finance function, and this is where mm. a much more unified finance function is very helpful. So we've been bringing together thinking from corporate finance colleagues in UK, uh, GI, um, project finance colleagues in the IPA, and also functional experts within departments to help and to be involved in any future work that goes on in this area. And for the MOJ, um, this was quite a big shock for us because, of course, um, we build prison, you know, we're trying to build prisons at the moment, and we expected to build our next one using uh, private finance. Uh, we, the Chancellor has announced in the budget that the next private, the next prison at Glen Parva will be used, built using uh, public sector capital instead. Emery, any thoughts about uh, actually how the government should approach this sort of transition? The PFI component. Yeah. Um, so my, my, bearing in mind my NHS background, I think uh, the PFIs for us have been significant cost. They've, mm. they've had huge impacts and continue to have huge impact on the NHS results. Um, and I'd encourage any finance function to get involved in how that could be reviewed and in some cases where relevant um, refinanced or repositioned in some way proactively um, sometimes difficult to do often difficult to do but I think it's something that needs to be attacked with more vigour to, to take it forward and achieve the best position for the public sector and Mike finally was sort of slightly against the clock uh, mismanaging my time budget um, this point Christopher made about sort of estimation of benefits. Obviously, finance is quite you know, good, we hope, on costs. Uh, benefits much more uncertain. We've done quite a lot of work in the Institute about uh, overestimation of the benefits of infrastructure projects sometimes, or optimism about the costs and the lack of sort of, you know, some of the benefits from, say, the, I think the approach the highways agencies taken to really get to grips with um, reference costing to see actually, you know, how do these things turn out in the past to inform inform the future. Uh, usually we give the sort of estimation of the benefits 
uh, to a bunch of analysts to sort of think about and use their sort of models or whatever to, to estimate. So where do you think this is going to actually get government making genuinely much better decision, realistic decisions about both the costs and benefit sizes, maybe of some of the sort of mega projects, you know, well, the HS2s those, and things like so that. So I think it's a really well-made point and a good question, so thank you. Um, I don't think government is as good at the, the benefit realisation end mm. of the equation as it is on the costing end of the equation, first of all. Um, but I think what we need to do is we need to do that thinking more upstream than we do at the moment. So as we develop business cases, I think we need to test the estimation of benefits much better in those. I think we need to show what the optimism bias is, as, as I've said before, and I think we need to have better range estimates of what the benefits might be, because we are a bit obsessed with spot estimates um, um, as the civil service and as accountants uh, uh, generally. Um, I would make two final points, I think. First of all, I think that um, we forget about evaluation too often, and I think within project uh, business cases, we need to define how evaluation is going to be done, when it's going to be done, and what it's going to cost as part of that process as well. And in terms of the estimation of benefits, benefits it goes back to my point about uh, data. We need to be very clear about how we're going to measure those benefits as well, because all too often, we set out an amount without thinking about what data is going to prove that we have delivered those benefits uh, at the end of the day as well. And just a final comment, should the insistence on including proper evaluation and the insistence on proper data capture of the benefits realised, should that be the finance direct, the senior finance person sitting there saying, before this goes ahead, we've got to have proper plans for this, or you know, are they going to be the owner within the department of making sure <laughs> that the department itself learns and, uh, well, this, and can judge its so, own So I think, this, I think this comes back to what, what I talked, was talking about, about yeah. standards. Standards can send everyone to yeah. sleep at, at one level, but this is why they're so important, because whether we're talking about uh, project standards yeah. owned by the IPA, mm. whether we're talking about uh, managing public mm. money owned by the finance mm. function, uh, the, the business case guidance in the Green mm. Book, for example, these things have all got to be brought together and we need, and we were talking about auditors earlier, but we need um, the auditors, whether they be mm. internal or external, to be taking a view about mm. the adherence to the yeah. standards that we're setting, not just the financial statements and the individual elements of business cases. Thank you very much. I'm going to close it there. I hope that answered all your questions. Thank you very much for answering so, asking so many questions and ensuring we had a really good discussion but thank you particularly to our panel, Martin and Marie, and in particular, Mike, for being so open and giving us such an interesting insight into the finance profession, uh, which really does seem to be going places and making a real step change from when I was last in government, I'd say. Uh, the next one in this series is going to be Rupert McNeil, the Chief People Officer uh, and the Cabinet Office, who is the head of HR function, which should be really, really interesting. Uh, that's on the 22nd of November if you want to come along. Can I thank Oracle again for facilitating this series and could I ask you to thank our panel?